So you might know of the mirror stage already um, because the mirror stage is the most well-received uh, metapsychological model uh, that Lacan uh, ever produced um, in the English-speaking world. Right? So uh, we have many people talking about it. Mirrors are, in general, an interesting phenomenon. And um, we see uh, people engaging with Lacan's mirror stage from a variety of fields, um, academic and outside of academy. Now, Lacan started working on the mirror stage around the 1930s, and he presented it actually uh, for the first time at the 14th Congress of the International Psychoanalytic Association. Uh, the IPA in 1933. This is the, a very famous uh, event, uh, well, for those that are interested in Lacan, because it, it was that lecture uh, which was disturbed by Ernest Jones in the middle. So Lacan was asked to get off the stage uh, with his nonsense. Um, it's interesting, Lacan writes about this uh, several places in his teaching and I'm just uh, rereading some texts recently and uh, Lacan makes a comment about um, Ernest Chris, uh, who he met at the conference. And he said, well, you know, I was on my way out, not really wanting to listen to all the other psychoanalysts. I only came in to, to give my own lecture and Chris was saying, no, this is, you don't do this. This is not, uh, this is not correct. So it's a very interesting conference and it's the first time that Lacan presents the mirror stage and uh, what some of you might have seen in uh, Lacan's collection Ecri, um, under the title the mirror stage as formative of the I function as revealed in psychoanalytic experience is the mirror stage paper is the famous paper and it is an edited transcript of this lecture now 1949 was an early point in the development of Lacan's teaching. And in this sense, when we read this paper, we see that uh, many of Lacan's later theoretical developments uh, do not present themselves there. And maybe I'll say that uh, today I'll specifically emphasize that his model of the RSI, the real symbolic and imaginary, it does not really um, manifest itself in that paper, at least, uh, well, maybe implicitly. Yeah? So it is an early paper, and this is the paper that we're going to start with, because this is the paper on the mirror stage, famous paper on the mirror stage. And while it is early in Lacan's teaching, I think that um, it still remains very useful uh, by itself. And, you know, it was, it inspired, uh, as we will see, it inspired many of Lacan's later conceptualizations. But we see other psychoanalysts uh, also following Lacan with this. And I'll just, uh, you know, I'll just uh, self-reference for a second. I'll say that I wrote a paper on autism just uh, a year ago um, that relies on Lacan's mirror stage, um, following some testimonies from autistic people that talk about their relationship with the mirror. So it's an early paper, but it's a very interesting uh, one. So we have to contextualize this a little bit and realize that Lacan poses this thesis of the mirror stage at a time where the Anglo-American school of ego psychology was already becoming quite popular in psychoanalytic circles. By the way, Ernest Gliss is one of its representatives. And the school of ego psychology, we might say, distinguishes itself from classical Freudian psychoanalysis by emphasizing the role of the ego in the psychoanalytic treatment. And Lacan goes very much against that. For Lacan, the ego has a secondary role in psychoanalysis. And well, in a nutshell, I can tell you that Lacan 
substantializes Freud's distinction between uh, what he calls, uh, and I mean Freud, secondary processes, which concern the construction of the ego, and primary processes, and this is a quote from Freud, and these concern the core of our being. So Lacan associates the latter with his notion of the subject of the unconscious, with his notion of the subject, the speaking being, the palette. And in relation um, to the ego, he, uh, well, the ego he associates with these secondary constructions, this illusory sense of selfhood, as we will see uh, very soon. Now, we must remember that Freud had explicitly stated that the ego is constructed after the fact. Uh, I mean, uh, after the drives have made their impression on the body and the psyche has been marked by subjectivity. So Lacan takes this statement quite seriously and he takes it a few steps further. And he argues that the ego is an imaginary construct that is fabricated in the psyche as a result of the child's narcissistic investment in their specular image. I would say, I say specular image as the image that appears in the mirror, and we're gonna talk about this image. So let's begin with this first rendition of the mirror stage. And as you've probably read in the abstract to this lecture, we're gonna go through three different renditions of the mirror stage, hopefully we'll get there, um, that represent or even four, we'll, we'll engage with even with four, that represent different takes on the mirror stage, different util utilizations of the mirror stage in the course of Lacan's career. So we begin with the first rendition, the one that is presented in the famous uh, paper on the eye function. So at this, early point, um, the mirror stage chiefly concerns um, an early moment in the child's life when it transitions from this original state of, uh, we might say, fragmented corporal reality to a state of organized corporal, corporal function. So we we, we're talking about this type of transition. And when we look at babies, and I mean week old babies, uh, even month old babies, we see that their bodies are a mess, right? They throw their hands everywhere. They have these uncontrollable ticks, these movements, they have these ticks and they move their tongues in this disorganized way. Um, we, we really can see that when we look at very, very young infants. And what we see is that it takes time for the human organism to inhabit a body that we might call organized. Now, the mere stage for Lacan is exactly this psychic process that enables us to wear our own skin. And at this point, at this early point, it is presented in its most figurative way. And this is what many people remember with the mirror stage, the figurative description. So I'll, I'll present it to you uh, briefly. Uh, Lacan presents the mirror stage as this scene uh, where the child encounters their own reflection in the mirror and assumes their specular image as the totalized correlate of their body. So in this scene, we see that Lacan emphasizes the organizing function, the crucial function that an image has on human embodiment. So in this sense, we, we, we see that at this point in his teaching, Lacan is, I would say, maybe challenging uh, phenomenological theories that posit a certain primacy to the flesh, to the body. For Lacan, the image uh, is the organizing function of the body. And in this sense, the body 
in its humanized form. And in this sense, I mean, not the body as this, um, let's say, bunch of sacs and cords. Uh, I am talking about the human body uh, in its comportment. So this body is propped up by an image, by the image of the body. Now, it is interesting because in the paper of the mirror stage, Lacan mentions um, some works by his contemporaries in the Gestalt movement. And he describes this assumption of the body image as something on the line of a, this jubilant aha moment. Right? This is a Gestalt speech, uh, aha moment where the child invests the image with libido and through this investment, the image is internalized as a representation of the unified body in the psyche. Now it is, well, it is quite puzzling and Lacan is also curious about that in this paper on the mirror stage. Um, so it is puzzling that it is a particular image that is seemingly predetermined or predestined to function in this way and not any other image, right? Because we're talking about an image that has this constitutive effect, but it cannot be just any image. It has to be the image of the body, the image of the infant in the mirror, right? Now, in a very uncommon way, and again, I'm, I'm just, let's say, um, planting some seeds of curiosity because I really um, recommend you go and read the paper. It's not a very complex paper and everyone finds somewhere to really obsess, uh, some paragraph to really obsess about. So, but I'll say that in a very uncommon way, we see Lacan going to studies of animal behavior in order to stress this point in the paper. And he talks, for instance, about pigeons. And he says that uh, scientists of his time have demonstrated that pigeons only go through a process of sexual maturation if they are exposed to an image of another pigeon or, and that's interesting, to an image of themselves, right? So Lacan goes to the animal world and he says, look, images have this constitutive function, not only for humans, but also for uh, animals. He talks about locusts saying uh, something uh, in a similar vein. So what we see is that Lacan develops a theory of a constitutive type of image. And he calls this image in the paper on the mirror stage, an imago gestalt. So why is it a gestalt? Well, we said that it's an aha moment, but also we call it a gestalt because it compensates for something that is incomplete, right? It creates a whole, the body image, or let's say the ego, the embodied ego, uh, that is bigger than its parts, right? The fragmented body, right? The body that is made of fragmented organs. So this is why we would call it a gestalt. And the term imago is also a very interesting one. And first of all, it refers to other psychoanalytic theories. And that's, that's interesting by itself. But also we see in the paper Lacan making a, a psychoanalytic joke. And he says that practitioners of antiquity, right? this is what he says, those that those who wrote the Bible or were there when the Bible was written, uh, already noticed the constitutive function of the image when they stated that human beings are created in the image and likeliness of God, right? This is what, what is called imago dei, right? This is how we, we say it. Now for Lacan, it is not the image of God that is constitutive, for Lacan, human beings are created by their own image. And that's a very interesting argument that, that you have here and presented in the paper. Now, 
we are talking about a psychic representation of the unified body, right? We're not talking about a unified body. The body itself on the organismic level does not truly correspond to its representation. And when we talk about this representation of the unified body, we see that Lacan associates it with Freud's notion of the ideal ego. Now you can uh, open Freud and you'll see that he makes a distinction in German between two terms, between ideal ich and ich ideal. So there is ideal ego and ego ideal. Uh, now Lacan takes this distinction very seriously and he, well, he talks about it in the paper on the mirror stage, but he, he implements it in many, many other places in his teaching. And it's a very, very fruitful distinction that uh, Lacan makes. And I'll just start by talking about the ideal ego, uh, because this form of, um, let's say, prototypical form of ego construction is deliberated in the paper on the mirror stage in 1949 and Lacan calls it the ideal I in the paper. This is how you'll find it translated, the ideal I. So in this paper on the mirror stage, the ideal ego or ideal I is presented as the most primordial form of ego construction prior to the function of the I in the formation of self-identity and the establishment of intersubjective relationships. So the ideal ego functions as an imaginary ideal, an imaginary ideal of perfection that in fact masks the fragmented reality of the child's body. And once the child identifies with the ideal ego, the child gains the basic organizing psychic faculties that are associated with it. And well, these faculties facilitate exactly the child's motor development and at a certain point allows the child to navigate its body um, in its environment. More than that, what we might say is that the ideal ego establishes a distinction between what is our body, or what is the child's body, what is inside of the body, what belongs to the body, and what is outside of it. Now, this is something we might learn a lot from by listening to autistic people, um, that we see that uh, it is not such an easy task to make these distinctions, right? Think about the vast amount of stimuli that floods our sensorial system at any moment. And these stimuli uh, are by themselves completely fragmented. They are not, uh, they, they, they don't produce, uh, let's say the experience uh, that one might call a human experience. They are, are a flooding of stimuli that happens uh, at any moment. And the baby, in a sense, uh, prior to being able uh, to make a distinction between, let's say, the body and, and what is outside, you know, uh, babies feel pain due to gas, for instance, and this pain collects in their stomach. And they might feel this pain as something overwhelming. Now, we might be able to say, oh, this is a pain in the body, in the stomach. The baby might hear a very loud sound, a crash, a, a bang. That comes from the outside, but it also affects the uh, sensorial system in a very uh, profound way. There is nothing that, well, let's say, truly um, makes this stimuli of the sound uh, to be something of the outside and the gas of the inside. There has to be some form of psychic representation that enables the subject to make this distinction. And we see, as I said, uh, that autistic uh, children have a hard time allocating 
these sensations uh, and knowing what comes from the inside and what presses on the body from the outside. Uh, in this sense, what is happening to me, in me, emanating from me or coming from the outside into me. Now, what Lacan argues is the, I, that the identification with the ego ideal constitutes a certain position in the world where the subject can associate feelings and sensations to the self and to the environment. Right? So it in fact compensates then for this initiatory fragmented corporeality of the human organism. Now, Lacan alludes in the paper on the mirror stage to a very interesting uh, German philosopher called Ulkskul. And he has this concept called Umwelt, which I find very, very interesting. And um, I'll give you an example from, uh, from Lacan where he talks about uh, the wild animal. Uh, so imagine, the ideal wild animal. The ideal wild animal is an animal that is born into the world and is already set to survive in such a, uh, in such a capacity that it procreates and um, survives in its own life for, in the best possible way, right? So we might say that the hardwired hard -wired instincts uh, of this wild animal perfectly match the environment that in, it interacts with. Now the term Umwelt is not environment as something on the outside. It, it refers to the environment, an environment that is particular to an organism. There's a famous um, paper on, um, on the Umwelt of the tick, for instance, which is very different from the Umwelt of the cat and the Umwelt of the human, right? Because the tick only senses some things like certain smells, certain temperatures. It doesn't see, doesn't have eyes like, like we have. So its environment, its Umwelt is, well, compared to the human Umwelt is limited. And the tick has its instincts that enables it to interact with these particular forms of stimuli and particular, um, let's say, aspects of its environment in a way that enables it to survive and procreate, right? So what we would say is that for the wild animal, there is a relationship between the instincts and the environment, right? For the wild animal, the instinct is set to accommodate it to its environment. And I always give uh, this example, and if you've listened to some of my lectures, you've probably heard this, uh, my story about the cow being born. So I'll be, I'll be brief that I, I've, been, I've witnessed a, a birth of a, of, a, of a cow and it was quite exciting. Um, and what happened is that the, 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 the baby cow just uh, got out of the world and immediately started walking around, sniffing. I, I guess it was searching for food, but just walking around, checking out uh, the little farm that, that I was staying at. And I was quite amazed, um, especially considering the fact that human babies are nothing like that. Uh, human babies are born and are actually unable to do anything. They, they will, and they have zero, zero percent, zero percent a chance to survive on themselves. So what, what we see is that the human organism is born lacking on the level of the instinct, right? Something is not reliable on the level of what is hardwired for the human. And what Lacan argues in this paper, and this is an argument that ha I have built on in my own work, uh, what he argues is that this gap between the instinct and the Umwelt is such a by the ego ideal, right? So the image is what is the thing that creates, that constitutes a certain 
bridging, but you know, it is not truly a connection between the instinct and the umwelt, but some sort of compensation, a supplementary uh, solution, so, so a supplement that creates a, a, a certain suturing of this gap. So the ideal ego with which one identifies with places the human subject in the humanized world. So I think this is a, let's say an interesting summary of, of the paper uh, on the near stage from 1949. And there's, there's much more to, to find in the paper, but let's leave it at that for today. And I want to progress now to some later models that Lacan developed of the mirror stage. And I'll start with a very common critique uh, of Lacan's paper on the mirror stage from 1949. So many scholars come to critique Lacan uh, when they read the mirror stage as a moment in the psychological development of the infant. And they base themselves on the assumption uh, that, well, and it's quite uh, a reasonable assumption that we can assume that some um, babies don't have access to mirrors, right? Or that some babies are born blind and never see their reflection in the mirror. So here we have a problem. If some babies are born blind, uh, do we assume then, then that they do not construct an ego, that they are not placed in the world, in their body, right? This is the line of, of argumentation. Um, well, of course not, right? Uh, of course not. Uh, clearly, uh, blind uh, babies, people are born blind, still have uh, egos, so it seems. Um, this critique, I would like to, to, to argue, is, is based on a very common misconception that we see in the history of psychoanalysis in many places. And this happens when psychoanalysts many times confuse structural remarks on the psyche as psychological accounts, right? So for instance, classic example, the Oedipus complex, right? So if you ask me, the Oedipus complex is a myth that is used to illustrate uh, a certain psychic structure. And the Oedipus complex is not a psychological experience or disposition that the child goes through in its development. I think, I, I, otherwise, but I think that babies don't want to murder their fathers and uh, sleep with their mothers. I, I don't think that this goes in the mind of the baby when uh, they go through the Oedipus complex. I think this is reasonable to, reasonable to assume. And on the same note then, when we think of the mirror stage, we have to understand that Lacan does not try to describe a psychological experience what we might call the phenomenology of the mirror, right? Uh, for Lacan, the mirror stage is an optical metaphor. And here I'm quoting Lacan, I'm not, I'm not inventing this. The mirror stage is an optical metaphor. It is a heuristic tool that helps us explicate something essential about the structure of the psyche. So what we see is that the reflection of the body image does not necessarily need to uh, happen on the surface of the mirror. The body can be reflected in many ways. We can play on this word reflected, but I'll give you one example through the body of others. So children in this sense, don't need to look at mirrors in order to develop egos. I don't think this is what Lacan is trying to say, uh, but, there is something about the optical relationship between the gaze and the specular image that exemplifies something essential about the human ego. And this relationship 
tells us something about the way uh, one is conferred uh, with a body, uh, with an identity, and is situated in the world. Right. So this is one that is very common in, in terms of the mere stage. There's another critique, um, which I, I in, in a way agree with, um, that states that at the time that the mirror, uh, the paper on the mirror stage was published, um, Lacan was focused um, on, let's say, um, the imaginary aspect uh, of the relationship with the mirror. And imaginary then uh, shouldn't be taken colloquially. Uh, at the time, Lacan used the term imaginary to express the illusion, fascination, and seduction that is particularly associated uh, with the relationship with the specular image. Now, starting from the early 1950s, the imaginary becomes one of the three registers of the psyche and is opposed to the symbolic and the real. This is what I was calling the RSI model. Now, at this time, Lacan calls the primary form of identification with the body image, the one that we discussed so far, imaginary identification. And some critics of Lacan um, are that in the earlier rendition of the mirror stage, we see that Lacan is too determined by the imaginary and neglects the function of the symbolic register of the psyche in the formation of the ego. And briefly stated, I can say that in this early, in Lacan's early teaching, he follows the work of Claude Lévi-Strauss, who associates the term symbolic with the set of structured rules that govern social relations, language, and the body. And it is true that in Lacan's early rendition of the mirror stage, his commentary on the function of the symbolic is scarce. Uh, he even comments at some point in the paper that these rules, these symbolic rules, are dependent on the identification with the specular image and follow it. But, in subsequent revisions of the mirror stage um, that are published in the course of the 1950s and 1960s, we see that the function of the symbolic register is progressively inserted into uh, the model. And this brings us to the second model of the mirror stage we will discuss today, which is in fact the first comprehensive model that integrates the, the function of the symbolic register in the mirror, mirror stage and is presented in Lacan's first seminar. Right? So in the first seminar already, we see Lacan developing an optical schema that he calls the schema of the two mirrors. And this is how Lacan phrases it. He says that the schema provides a metaphor of an optical nature that concerns specific psychic operations, known in psychoanalysis as identification. And it is interesting uh, because what we see, and I'll, I'll present this schema in a second and I have the, the diagram for you, is we see that the schema comes to clarify the nature of two different forms of identification, one imaginary and one symbolic, and is in fact centered on the subject's relationship with language. So let's begin, and I'll I'll share with you. Um, I prepared some 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 uh, slides with diagrams, so you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, here we go. So uh, we start with this diagram, which is a schema uh, that the schema of the two mirrors is based on, and this is um, an illustration of a well-known optical experiment that is conducted in the 1940s by a French physician called Henri Baus. Now, this is called the experiment of the inverted bouquet. And what you see in this experiment, um, you see a concave mirror that is positioned in front of a table on which stands a vase on top of the table. And hidden under the table is an upside down bouquet of flowers. Now the spectators uh, are expected to focus their gaze on a certain point 
in the concave mirror somewhere above the face. And at this, if the spectator looks at this angle, the image of the bouquet is reflected in the concave mirror and it is perceived as though it is actually in the vase. So it's an illusion. Right? So the image of the flowers bounds on the concave mirror. And then if the spectator stands in the right place, it, it seems as though the vase holds uh, the flowers. In fact, it holds the image of the flowers. Now, Lacan augments uh, this experiment and he does that by introducing a second mirror, a second plane mirror uh, into the schema that is situated in front of the first concave mirror. So you see in this diagram right now, there's a plane mirror in the center of the diagram and the concave mirror moves to the left. This is the schema of the two mirrors. This is what we're gonna work on today. Um, hopefully, uh, uh, it will be interesting to you and we'll, we'll see how we can implement that uh, later on. So similarly to the original experiment, we see that the bouquet and the vase are situated in front of the concave mirror, but Lacan switches their place. So now the bouquet is on top of the table and the vase is hidden underneath. So you can see that in the schema I, I provided you with. Now in this rendition of the experiment, the spectator is situated between the two mirrors. So he's situated between uh, the concave and plane mirror and the spectator faces the plane mirror and is with their back to the concave mirror. And you can see that at point uh, S, um, S divided one, right? So this, the dollar sign one, we'll see that in the, in the scheme. Now, from this position, the spectator is able to perceive the same illusion uh, as we see in the original experiment, which is the image of the vase containing the bouquet of flowers. But in this case, the spectator perceives this illusion only indirectly, right? Because the image of the vase containing the bouquet of flowers is reflected on the surface of the plane mirror, right? It is not directly perceived, it is mediated by the plane mirror. And this is how Lacan describes it. I'll read it out loud for you. If one put a plane mirror in the middle of the room, which I turn my back on the concave mirror, I would see the image of the vase as clearly as if I were at the end of the room, even though I wouldn't see it in a direct manner. What I am going to see in the plane mirror, firstly, my own face there where it isn't. Secondly, at a point symmetrical to the point where the real image is, I am going to see this real image appear as a virtual image. So I'll unpack this a little bit uh, because what we see here is that Lacan in his theme of the two mirrors delves deeply into the study of optics and he makes a distinction between what is called a real and a virtual image. Now I'll briefly tell you that in the study of object of optics, an image is determined as real, and this is not the Lacanian real, this is real in optics. Uh, it is determined as real in so far as it is perceived as being situated in an actual physical space. So when we think about real images, we think about images that behave, sorry, that behave like objects. And we can take them like objects. Um, Lacan phrases that uh, in seminar one, he says, well, real images can be inserted into the world of real objects, can be accommodated in it at the same time as real objects, even bringing these real objects an imaginary disposition. Now, in the original experiment uh, that only has the concave mirror, the image of the inverted bouquet is considered to be real, right? And, and this is because the concave mirror reflects the image of the bouquet as if it is situated in a, the space directly viewed by the spectator, right? It is perceived as if the actual vase uh, is situated in an actual physical space with the actual flowers. Now, in the revised two mirror schema, 
the real image of the vase, which still is reflected on the concave mirror, is not directly perceived by the spectator because their back is turned to it. But the illusion persists because the spectator can perceive the vase containing the bouquet in the reflection in the plane mirror. Now, in other words, we see that by inserting the plane mirror into the schema, Lacan introduces a surplus virtual space that is situated to the right of the plane mirror in which virtual images of the vase containing the bouquet of flowers can be perceived by the spectator. Virtual images are images that are not situated in the space we perceive, but in the space behind the mirror, in this magical domain behind the mirror. Now, what we already see here, without even delving deeper, is that virtuality is the essential state of the ego, according to Lacan. The ego being by itself an exterior fiction, a simulation, as some might call it today. Now, this is an interesting take on the ego. Um, well, because we see here that the ego is in no way a benchmark for some kind of objective reality of the subject. The ego is that which is on the one hand most intimate to our understanding of ourselves, but is by itself a fictitious image that exists on the outside in a space that does not actually exist in a virtual space. Moreover, we see that the virtuality of the ego marks another fact. And that fact is that the mirror stage entails a certain disjunction between the real unmediated body and our body image. There is a gap there. There is something that does not such, that does not connect, that is, does not have a direct relationship. And a good example for that uh, comes from experience and you know, sometimes, um, you know, one plays soccer um, and you get hurt. Let's say you get cut on the leg, you get a little cut, uh, but you play and you play. And just when the game ends, you all of a sudden look at your leg and you see you're bleeding. You've been bleeding for the past 20 minutes. And only then you start feeling the pain, right? Only when you perceive your the image of your body. This shows you that even a soccer player, which we clearly different, distinguish from a baby that cannot move, a soccer player can move a very fine way. Uh, even then, when we are adults and we have acquired, uh, let's say, our bodies, uh, the disjunction between the body itself, the organismic, I don't know how, how even to call it, and the body image, it remains, it remains. And the image is what uh, enables us to uh, create somewhat of a bridge. So this is one of Lacan's points that we see uh, emphasized here in the second, the second rendition of the mirror stage, that we gain our humanized corporeality through the gestalt of the image, but that this is achieved only virtually. Right? It is through a simulation that embodiment can become human. Now, <clears throat> I've already uh, said that uh, the schema of the two mirrors is used by Lacan in order to demonstrate um, this notion of identification. And identification is a very loaded concept, both in Lacan and Freud. But just briefly, I can say that identification is a, a process that is constitutive and it provides the subject with psychic modes of coherence or integration, as, as we say. Now, Lacan uses elements that appear in the scheme of the two mirrors in order to illustrate two forms of identificatory integration, as I said, an imaginary and symbolic one. So in this sense, we see that the mirror stage at this point becomes the bedrock of a theory of identification in Lacan's teaching. 
Now, in order to do that, Lacan associates the elements in the schema uh, with several psychoanalytic concepts. And I'll go through them and then um, I'll turn off the schema and we can see each other's faces again. And again, I'm, I'm happy with uh, every, everyone who has their video on. It's, it's really great. It's really helping me out. So please, if you can do it, I, I'd appreciate that. Um, so let's go over these elements in the schema and you have the schema in front of your eyes right now. So the plane mirror, the mirror in the middle of the schema, it represents for Lacan the function of the symbolic register. And even more specifically, the symbolic register is not associated with the plane mirror itself, but with the virtual space to its right. Now, Lacan claims that the bouquet of flowers, uh, the one that stands on the table, represents the sexual drives or the partial drives. And we'll get to that later in the last segment of, of the lecture today. Now, in the, in the manifestation in this schema, the partial drives are associated with the ex exactly this state of helpless, fragmented corporeality that is prior to the mirror state, right? They're split. There are many flowers, they're split. Nothing holds them together when, when they're on the table. Um, the vase that is hidden under the table, this vase represents what we might call the stoma or the body that is inaccessible to the psyche. Now, the real image of the vase, the one that we see in the original experiment, the one that is reflected on the concave mirror, represents the body as a reservoir of libido and is associated, I, I might say, with these instinct-based corporal faculties that can be said to orchestrate these effects that some images have on sensory motor behavior, right? So this a more hardwired um, functions. Um, <clears throat> now, Lacan incorporates the relationship between these elements to illustrate a threefold process. And try to follow me on this one. So in the first stage, the bouquet of flowers is contained by the real image of the vase that is reflected on the concave mirror, right? Um, this is the illusion that we see in the original experiment. Uh, and this illusion is not perceived by the spectator in the scheme of the two mirrors. So this happens under the hood, et cetera. In the second stage, the image of the bouquet that is contained by the vase is reflected on the surface of the plane mirror and is perceived by the spectator as being situated in the virtual space to the right of the plane mirror in the schema. And you can see it at point I, little, little thing, and small a. Now, this image represents the ideal ego that we discussed earlier in the uh, early rendition of the mirror stage. In the third stage, this whole montage is taken as an ideal blueprint for the construction of the ego on the level of self-identity and intersubjective relations. And this is what you see at point I on the right-hand side, right? where Lacan was saying, I see my own face where it's not. Because there's the bouquet, right? You see the bouquet, the body image, and then you see your own face, right? On the virtual side of the, of the mirror. Now, the, this psychic construction of the ego on this secondary level is associated with Freud's notion of the ego ideal. Now, Lacan sees the ego ideal as another crucial prototypical aspect of the ego that is established in what he names symbolic identification. And with the scheme of the two mirrors, we see that Lacan demonstrates that symbolic ideals take a crucial part in the formation of the ego ideal and are also directly linked to the formation of the ideal ego. Right? Now, unlike the ideal ego that represents an idealized image that the subject sees in itself, the ego ideal represents a symbolic vantage point 
from which the subject perceives itself as it is seen by others. And so we might say this is a vantage point from where the subject gains its position in society. And here it's interesting, again, to think about the Oedipus complex in these terms and how do we see it in the Lumière stage. Because it is only through this vantage point that the two prototypical psychic components of the ego are integrated. The ideal ego, the ideal body image, and the perceived ideal of self-identity, the ego ideal. So we see that the schema represents an interdependence between the imaginary and the symbolic. And it is formalized in precise optical, uh, through precise optical relationships between these elements in the scheme. So let's, uh, let's put the schema aside for a bit. I promised uh, three renditions. Now I see uh, even five. We're gonna we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna talk about a lot of renditions of the mirror stage um, because I did want to mention that this construction of the ego ideal is is finally incorporated in the mirror stage in a later revision uh, in Lacan Seminar Eight, and this is also one that is quite common and many people that know Lacan and read Lacan know about this rendition. Uh, in this new version, the child is not, does not prop itself in front of the mirror using a toy or another apparatus. It is the parent who holds the child in front of the mirror. And Lacan stresses that it is only in relation to the parent's signifying gesture. This is you, my pretty boy, for instance, that the child can assume its body image. So again, we have to remember the parent here is only a metaphor. Lacan is not talking about parents holding their children in front of the mirror. A more properly structural way to refer to this paternal function is through Lacan's concept of the big other. So the big other, a very complex concept in Lacan's teaching uh, and is contrasted to what we might call the small other which is a term that refers to the specular image, actually, to the ego. Uh, the big other is a term that refers to the radical alterity, this otherness that is essentially associated with the function of language in the psyche. And Lacan even goes as far as equating the big other with the symbolic register itself uh, in its particular manifestation for each subject. So the other, the big other is considered as the locus outside of one's conscious control, the locus of signifiers that determines one's psychic reality on a symbolic level and exceeds the one determined by imaginary identification. And in this revised mirror state with the parent, we see that the big other intervenes in the psychic construction of the subject from the get go. Right? that it is only through a chain of signifiers, through a pretty boy, that the I can be binded to the subject. Right? So the I in isolation uh, is not enough. The image in isolation is not enough. There has to be a chain of signifiers, pretty boy, good boy, my good boy, uh, that binds these two together. So we see, in other words, that uh, Lacan states at this point that one does not have access to the body, if they do not go through the defiles of the, the symbolic. So that's a very interesting argument by itself. <clears throat> so we have two more, um, two more renditions to go through. Mm. Oh, let's see, uh, uh, I'm not sure how we are on time. I think we have a little more time. So uh, let's see how Lacan uses the schema of the two mirrors, not only as a descriptive model of the psyche, but also as a dynamic tool uh, for the understanding of the psychoanalytic treatment. So what we see is that Lacan uses this schema to reveal the way in which the relationship uh, between different elements uh, in the schema can represent subjective transformations that the analysis go through during the psychoanalytic treatment. And well, 
Lacan makes many notes uh, on that line, but let's concentrate on one of them that has to do with the treatment of neurosis. Now, Lacan argues that the relationship between the different elements in the schema depend on the inclination of the plane mirror. And that makes sense, right? Because if the plane mirror changes its angle, the whole uh, interplay of, of images completely changes. So if we move it enough, the whole illusion can evaporate. What we say is that in the common unraveling of the subject's identification in the mirror stage, the inclination of the mirror is set in this way. But Lacan says that in analysis, the inclination of the plane mirror can be manipulated by the psychoanalyst when they direct the treatment. And this idea is rooted in the fact that Lacan insists that the psychoanalyst must position itself and themselves in the place of the big other. So the analyst um, you know, is not an ego, is not a friend, is not someone who gives advice, is not someone who, who, can, who talks to you about their lives and about themselves. Right? The position of the psychoanalyst is in the place of the big other. And this gives rise to an effect on the ego that is directly opposite to the one proposed by ego psychologists. So contrary to the idea of strengthening one's ego through an identification with the analyst, Lacan sees the work of psychoanalysis as entailing the disruption of the imaginary relationship that provides consistency and wholeness to the ego. So what Lacan in fact says is that the power of psychoanalysis lies not in providing the subject with a coherent image of the self, but exactly in positioning the subject in the place of its very splitting. And this enables the analysis to reintegrate the effects of their imaginary identification in the symbolic, and thus are allowing the articulation of desire in symbolic means. And I'll demonstrate this using the scheme of the two mirrors again. Um, and this is another um, rendition of the schema of the two mirrors. And we see here um, that Lacan demonstrates how the inclination of the mirror can represent the subjective transformation. So he says that when the analyst posi is positioned in the place of the big other, and this is represented by the plain mirror schema, the psychoanalyst is able to, let's say, uh, provide the analysis with access to the illusory dimension of imaginary identification. And more specifically, we see that by tilting the plane mirror in 90 degrees, the psychoanalyst is able to transition the spectator from their position in S1 to the left-hand side of the schema, schema and position of S bar two on the right-hand side. You can see this in the schema that I attached. From this position, the spectator directly perceived the inverted vase illusion where the real image of the vase containing the bouquet at A in the schema, and the virtual image of the vase containing the bouquet at B in the schema are simultaneously perceived. And as a result, Lacan argues that the ego's dependence on illusory imaginary ideals that are rooted in the assumption of completeness of the specular image of the ideal ego, these are uncovered and the mirage is dispelled. And this is what Lacan defines as depersonalization, that he observes not as a setback in analysis, but actually as moments of breakthrough in the analysis of uh, neurotic subjects. It's been a dense lecture so far, and now we're, we're in the last, in our last uh, subject, the last rendition of the mirror stage that I provide for you today. And in the last version of the mirror stage, we'll briefly talk about the integration of the object A into the mirror stage. Now, Lacan comments several times in his early teaching that the topology of the mirror stage is lacking precisely because it doesn't give a direct account of the function of the object. In his seminar 10 on anxiety, he gives it another shot and he attempts to do exactly that. Uh, so let us talk a little bit about the object A, or at least I'll make a distinction between the object of desire 
and the object cause of desire, which is also called objet petit a, and we'll call it object from now on. The object of desire is the object towards which desire tends. So desire works in such a way that whenever we get our hands on the object we desire, right? Whenever our package from Amazon arrives in our house, desi desire withers for a moment, right? But it reemerges afterwards as a desire for another object and we go online and shop some more. So in this sense, we should talk about objects of desire in the plural, right? This is a chain of objects whose common denominator is subjective. Now, the object A, on the other hand, is the algebraic notation of the common denominator of the subject's desirous tendencies. So it is what causes desire rather than the object towards which it intends. It sets desire in motion and is said to define the conditions that determine the features that make specific objects desirable for the subject. So by being a condition for desire rather than an object desired, the object A is not conceived as a positivistic object. It does not materialize in reality. The object A is better described as a placeholder. It's a constitutive site of a lack that keeps desire searching for some object to fill it up with. Now, in his discussion of object A in seminar 10, Lacan argues that this object persists prior to the identification with the ideal ego in the plain mirror. And well, its position then is established in the mirror stage, in the scheme of the mirror stage, before the image is internalized and a distinction between an inside and an outside of the ego is instituted. Now, this complies with Freud's discussion of drive satisfaction. He argues there that the satisfaction of the aim of the drive is achieved when it meets with something that is inside the body, while the object of the drive is already situated on the outside. This, what Lacan does in Seminar 10 with the mirror stage is taking that idea from Freud and incorporating it in a new rendition of the mirror stage, uh, which I will show you right now, and will be the last schema I share with you today. Here we go. Um, so in this schema, Lacan goes back to his distinction between the real and virtual image of the face. And what we see is that the real image of the face is situated to the left of the plane mirror and symbolizes, as I said earlier, the body as a reservoir of libido. And it's marked by an I and parenthesis A. Now, the virtual image of the face is situated to, to, on the right-hand side of the plane mirror, and it symbolizes, as you remember, the ideal ego, the ego of one's body, and is marked by small i and this little, little dot and A. The virtual image is only seen through the virtual, through the plain mirror, while the real image can be seen without it, without the plain mirror from a certain angle. Now, Lacan argues that the body as libido container, the real image, is brought into relation with the image of the body, the ideal ego, in the mirror stage through the plain mirror, which symbolizes the big other. Now, this happens, one might say, when the baby stops receiving satisfaction from its own body at a reservoir of libido, what we might call some form of you know, primordial autoerotism, masturbation, something like that, and invests libido in its own image. This might remind you of narcissism, yes. So invest libido in its own image, and also at some point in the image of the body of others, right? So this is an explanation of how drive satisfaction comes to be symbolized, how it is experienced coherently in relation to an object. And it is precisely in this oscillation of libido between the body as reservoir of libido and the image of the body between these two eyes that something doesn't so much escape, as Lacan says, from the 
I parenthesis A to the I dot parenthesis A. Something is not transferred through the symbolic other, through the big other. So I, I will say it in other words, the, what happens in the identification with the ego ideal is a process of investment of libido, but it is a process which limits the field of libidinal interests and excludes a certain type of object, right? So an object that is, does not go through the symbolic, is not, does not successfully transferred to the image, right, in the symbolic, and remains on the left-hand side. This object is classically associated with the mother in psychoanalysis, but for Lacan, this is the object. So the object A is now represented with the real flowers of the schema, right? These flowers that remain there that nobody actually can see, but through their image, right? So it's the flowers that without the plain mirror would have no image. Um, this tells us something foundational on the relationship that humans have with their image and with their body. And it gives us a clue as to the partiality and exteriority of the object. And we see this in this schema that uh, Lacan presents to us here. I'll finish by saying that Lacan gives an interesting um, example of the gaze. And the gaze, uh, you know, our own gaze, the gaze of the subject, organizes the subject's field of vision and it ties us to our subjective position in the world, right? Again, we remain on the level of the optical metaphor. But the gaze does so when it is by itself absent from the field of vision, right? I can never see my own gaze. Now, this is where the mirror comes into the picture, right? In the mirror, I look at myself and I see my gaze. But in the mirror, the gaze that is seen is not my own gaze precisely because it is seen, right? the gaze by itself is never captured as an object. Even when we see it in the mirror, it is always a dead gaze. It's a reflection, it's a surface. It's not the gaze. Mm -hmm. Now Lacan argues that this absence, the, the, this absence that, that I was describing right now is characteristic of the object. Eh? And it is through it that we can understand something quite profound uh, about the human psyche and about the condition of desire. And I think that in this final schema, one might find the coordinates to deeply engage with that on an analytic and theoretical level. So we had several models uh, today. I think we'll stop here. And um, yeah, maybe there's some questions. So thanks for listening so far. And I'd love to hear you out. Yeah, thank you, Leon. We, uh, I know we've got a question from Cherry. Um, hi, yes, hi. Um, for taking my question. Um, I haven't really heard you speak much about dreams or Lacan's associations with the unconscious mind and how that fits in with this theory as far as the mirror stage. I'm wondering, um, Dr. Brenner, if you could speak about that in terms of his perceptions of how dreams play a role in um, that particular theory that he has, if potentially it begins with dreams as far as the mirror stage or potentially that uh, plays a role later on in development. Yeah, thanks for the question, Cherry. Um, I'm just writing down some, uh, some notes. Um, yeah, so um, I'll start by saying that the mirror is such a mythical figure. It is such an interesting entity. And there's so much literature written about it. Of course, you know, uh, Alice in Wonderland, um, uh, the, the one with the, uh, is that Snow White? Yes. No, the Sleeping Beauty, right? There's, these are stories that we grew up on and they uh, entail thoughts about mirrors. Um, I would say that it's important to remember that Lacan does not 
um, construct his psychoanalysis uh, basing himself on these figurative uh, ideas, right? So I would say that Lacan is not so much interested in the mirror as it appears in the dream or the mirror as it appears in, uh, in stories or fables or, um, or myths. You know, this is what Lacan would call applied psychoanalysis and he uses this term in a very derogatory way. He basically says, yeah, I can open any book and, uh, and impose psychoanalytic notions on, on the things that I find there. So basically any story is an Oedipal drama if I want to. I, I, can, I can impose some kind of psychoanalytic interpretation on any piece of literature, any, any artistic uh, creation. So for Lacan, the mirror is not so much this mythical entity. For him, the mirror is a metaphor. It's a useful metaphor to describe a structure which by itself is not dependent on any relationship with mirrors, right? So this is how Lacan would use it. However, Lacan does talk about the way we think in the paper on the mirror stage, and he talks about dreams in the paper. And he says, look, there's so many dreams um, that have to do with um, elements which might remind us of the body, of the body image. These might be uh, complete and whole uh, elements, uh, uh, like, uh, I don't know, protective castles and uh, bridges. Uh, it could be also dreams of fragments of the body. So people have dreams of fragmented body parts, right? The fragmented body. And Lacan is saying, well, we see here that the body is in, the body image is an essential building block of the humanized world. We construct our thinking, our, me our, our metaphors and our concepts using the body. And uh, this is Lacan's uh, argument at that point, which is very early, but if you open a metaphor theory, contemporary metaphor theory today, you'll see that, um, yeah, people say how the body is so important to construct metaphors that have nothing to do with the body, right? So we talk about, uh, you know, um, uh, we have metaphors of, uh, about electricity, about weather, about relationships with other people that have to do with the body and the way that it operates. And this, in a way, shows that, well, the body, the ideal ego, which is so important for Lacan's theory of the mirror stage, uh, is in fact, um, does in fact, is in fact used as building blocks for many other elements that uh, we engage with on the level of meaning. Uh, and this is what we might see in creation and dreams and in, in artistic uh, forms, etc. So, thank you, Sherry. I saw two more questions, I think. Yeah. We've got um, Meba. Let's see. And we've got Judith. Okay. Where, ah, here we go. How's it? Hi there. It's Maeve here. Um, hi, Maeve. <laughs> hi. Um, I, I'm doing some research on, on autistic children um, mm -hmm. and developing language through the use of drama therapy. So there's a couple of um, points I just wanted to pick up on in relation to the, the concept of gestalt in, in, um, in the mirror stage that you described and, and the correlation, if there's any sort of correlation between the description of gestalt processing in autistic children that's commonly used in, in some fields. I don't know if it's something that you're familiar with. Mm -hmm. Well, this is definitely something we should hash out uh, together later, privately. I'd love to hear about your work. As, as you probably know, I'm very much involved with research on autism. Um, I, I might say that, well, the, you asked about autism, which is very relevant, but I'll say like outside the field of autism, the treatment of autism, uh, I think that Gestalt psychology would be utterly alien to uh, most of, of what is done in the Lacanian uh, treatment. Mm -hmm. um, in, in, in working with autistic children, I think that there is something, something to it, 
And um, there's actually a, a paper that hopefully will be published very soon. It's been um, accepted, but we're waiting for uh, some revisions uh, that engages with this question in terms of art therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and, there, uh, and there I discuss um, the use of, of uh, images uh, in the construction of, let's say, conceptual gestalts. And I, I, I feel that there might be yeah. some overlap. Yeah, that's it. Right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and we should yeah. talk about it later. So okay. I'll just okay. send and, may, and make you a little bit excited, hopefully, so that you'll have the strength to send an email. Uh, when, when I will do. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, there's something there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maeve. Next, we've got uh, Judith. You just need to Sorry, um, yes. you just, yep, yes. there we go. Okay. Um, well, I am a psychodramatist and uh, out of a developmental point of view, we call the first stadium, the mother is, is uh, nursing, the child is doubling to understand the intentions, the feelings and the bodily expressions of the child. It's very close, the doubling and uh, a kind of mentalization process <laughs> of the mother if they have the ability to mentalize. Uh, and uh, the other phase is more the more developed one is the mirroring we call that the mother's face is not a mirror, but it's functioning as a mirror to, to reflect of, of the child, of the feeling of the child, to give it back, so to speak, not to doubling it, understand it, but to reflect. Um, and does it make any sense in the Lacanian? Oh. <laughs> from point of view? Well, <laughs> I, this is a very difficult question, Judith. I, you know, we, we, of course, we can find uh, similarities and in, in correspondences, of course. Um, but I, I guess the question is, will they be useful? Hmm? Can we learn something? And yeah, I think that I cannot give you an answer at this point. Uh, because you said that even there is no mirror, there are other bodies. Yes, yes, the child is in connect with. Mm -hmm. so I wonder if the mother's face, which is the, it's, it's a primary object, uh, mirroring the child. I, I, I think it has to be. Oh, well, I can just briefly say that um, the uh, the image of the uh, of the, the ideal ego again is not equated with the position of the mother in life. Right, it's uh, the position of the mother is, is is a very distinct element in Lacanian vocabulary, uh, and in this sense, the ideal ego or the ego in all of its renditions is associated with the small other, right? With with mm -hmm. what Lacan draws as the autre, with a, a a small a, and in this sense, when I when I was saying that the body uh, of others can serve as a, an image to identify with. I was referring to the body of other infants. Right? So an infant, for instance, and this is a, a process that's called transitivism in the history of psychoanalysis, where there's a certain confusion, conflation of egos, right? The child goes and slaps one child on the right cheek, and then the child holds its own left cheek and cries, right? So there's a mirroring here, there's a certain identification, but we see that on the level of the, uh, let's say the, um, the peer, yes, the peer, the ego, which is a peer. The, fu the, the function of the mother, and again, I'm saying function because I'm not talking about a mother. Uh, yeah. Because any, any, a lot of people can, can fulfill that function for a subject. Um, so the function of the mother would be very much distinct from that. Right? So when we speak about mirroring in terms of this identification that happens in the mirror stage, we would not be speaking about the mirroring of the mother. Right? So this is what I can briefly tell you. Uh, okay, just, okay. Uh, I will study a little bit more Lacan so to understand better. Fantastic. Then I then I've done a good job. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Judith. Thank you. And uh, next we have uh, Raimi. I hope I said that name right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Rami. 
Uh, thanks, Leon. I'm sorry my camera isn't working today for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask uh, a bit about the, uh, in the last uh, schema that you showed us, um, you mentioned uh, the metaphor that is often used uh, in relation to the mother. Uh, so I was, it's uh, been a bit difficult for me to understand because there's a lot uh, of people who talk about like this idea of the separation or the necessity of the separation from the mother at a certain point and that kind of developmental narrative uh, of subjectivity. And um, I was wondering like, what does that actually, um, like how would this relate to what you're speaking about now? Because I, if I understood correctly, um, it's as if there is something lost in this uh, symbolization uh, in the last schema that we can we can never really get back because the original vase we can't have a direct relationship with it if there's this mirror the big A in the middle and to separate from if that is the mother like the original fullness maybe uh, of the direct relationship uh, is it like to accept that and maybe intervene in some way? I know maybe I'm, uh, uh, my question isn't actually <laughs> very clear in my own mind, but I was just trying to understand um, the idea of the separation from the mother in the psychological texts and if this relates to what you're talking about. Mm. Yes, it's, it's a question that uh, engages with, uh, with everything, right? It's, a, it's, it's such a question. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you um, an answer from, from one uh, perspective. Um, you know, um, again, res resorting to, to a use of a myth, um, you know, because for Lacan, there is no dyadic relationship that is prior to uh, the uh, function of, of language, the, the paternal function. For Lacan, the father intervenes from the get-go. Um, and... Um, what what we might see or, or call this this little myth is you know the child is is born um, and is very much um, uh, interested in occupying the place of the mother's desire. It wants to be desired by the mother. It wants to correspond with the desire of the mother. Uh, but um, in uh, let's say uh, commonly that is uh, impossible. Uh, because uh, the mother is sometimes not there. Uh, so sometimes uh, the child is hungry or needs a hug, but mommy is in the other room. Uh, but if we want to speak of this in strict psychoanalytic terms, we might say that <clears throat> there is something in the libidinal economy of the child which is necessarily uh, um, subtracted, which is whatever mommy gives daddy, or whatever mommy gave daddy for me to be here, right? So this is the uh, prohibition of incest. So. Um, the child, uh, again, I'm continuing with the myth, questions the desire of the mother in order to position itself in, that, in its place. And this is what we might uh, call uh, an, a failed attempt or the failure inherent to imaginary identification. The child wants to see himself as the ideal, uh, as the, ob the ideal objects that will satisfy the mother's um, desire completely. Um, but in order to escape, and you're already identifying this myth as the Oedipal myth, in order to um, traverse the, uh, the imaginary, this imaginary fantasy, the child does not uh, take the position of this imaginary object that does not exist, hmm? it, but takes the position, another position, uh, classically the position of the father, uh, we might say more structurally, the position of the symbolic, right? So it is through the symbolic that desire, that the, the desire of the other can be mediated. And in this sense, I can gain some access to the desire, right? I was describing the scheme of the two mirrors right now in these figurative lyrical terms of the Oedipus complex. Basically, we're also talking about alienation and separation, as you might know, Rami, I'm sure, from uh, seminar 11. But what we see is that in the scheme of the two mirrors, something, every, everything has to be mediated through the plane mirror. This is the, uh, the symbolic represented there. And when the desire of the mother, let's say, is mediated through the symbolic, yes, the child gains a position right on the right-hand side, but also loses something. There is a castration, right? Something is left 
out, is subtracted and remains, something is not caught uh, by the chain of signifiers, right? And this is the A. And we might say that it's the A on the side of the mother, right? Because it originated in this question, in this initial questioning of desire uh, that was situated on, on that level. So yeah, I think this is a, a nice way to describe the paternal function in the Oedipus complex. And uh, the way that A, object A, is in fact a, 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 an, an outcome of, of, of what Lacan refers to as subjectification, as an alienation and a separation. So Rami, I hope this was somewhat uh, coherent, um, but I also hope you'll read some more. Thank you. Leon, do we have time for one more? Yeah, let's take, uh, let's take Mika, yeah. And then, and yeah. then you're gonna show us your book. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, reminder, yeah. Hi. Am I on now? Yes. All right, so thank you for the presentation. I loved it and- um, Oh, thank you very much. Um, well, uh, in, in the first seminar, um, there is a major theme on transference, uh, especially on the early uh, chapters that talk about a certain uh, moment in the analysis, which Lagan isolates as where, where a patient says that they become specifically aware of the presence of the analyst. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if this could then be connected to the schema because Lacan himself doesn't do it in, in the seminar in some way. But, uh, well, there's also the idea that I was thinking of, of the ideal mastery in, in, in this whole schema that's this, this Hegelian theme of, of characterizing desire as the desire of the other and, and as the uh, sort of like a antagonism between a slave and a master mm -hmm. and but I, I sort of cannot bring this through together in, in certain way that how is he saying that desire is some kind of a struggle with the master but in the image we find a certain anticipated mastery and there is certainly I think a place for the transference in that whole thing but I don't know if that sounds coherent here yes okay i will uh, i will give you one answer and and uh, direct you to a text uh, for the second question that you have so i'll start with the second uh, answer um yes you know lacan talks a lot about we we haven't really touched that today but lacan talks about the fact that you know the the identification with the image involves a certain misidentification and, and misrecognition, right? Something does not correspond. And Lacan talks about the fact that the image in the mirror always seems more complete than the state of the subject's body itself. So Lacan talks about a certain primordial rivalry, aggressivity, right? If you open a cri, and this is uh, where I think you'll find some information for uh, if you click, the paper following the paper on the mirror stage is called uh, aggressivity in psychoanalysis, but well, aggressivity uh, uh, for sure. And that paper deliberates exactly that point. So I think you'll find that very fruitful for your second uh, question. About your question on transference, I think it's an excellent observation. I haven't taken that into mind. And now that you mention it, it, it makes a lot of sense to think of transference. Uh, through the coordinates of the two mirrors. And I would say, look, the scheme of the two mirrors, it, um, let's say, um, represents some type of dynamic, some structure that is essential to um, neurotic subjects, I would say. We can talk about psychosis as well when we change some coordinates, but these coordinates, uh, they speak about the identification that is the uh, let's say the uh, trademark the uh, uh, of of neurosis, and this is where the subject sees its reflection or sees itself, perceives itself, perceives the body image, and then perceives 
a position from which it sees itself, this is the ego ideal. So we have ideal ego and ego ideal. Thinking about transference, right? Transference is exactly, well, the condition for the subject to work through these imaginary attachments, right? these imaginary relationships and, and, and achieve a, a different relationship to these ideals, right? This is how it goes with neurosis. But this happens only when the subject is able to see itself through the analyst. So the analyst is situated in the place of the, of the plane mirror. So I would say then, interesting, enough that transference takes hold when the analyst becomes truly this place of the big other, this plain mirror, this virtual space, right? And it is then that the analysis starts, let's say, maybe uh, engaging with some imaginary uh, ideas, imaginary relationships that unravel in the transference, right? And, oh, why do you look at me like this? What do you think about me, what, why did you say that right now? And these are worked through in the transference, right? So I would say transference kicks in when the analyst becomes this mirror, but not mirror in terms of mirroring, right? That we know from other forms of psychoanalysis. The analyst doesn't copy whatever the analysis does, right? But the analyst is a place, it's a locus where the analysis words can be deployed. And then the analyst can, analysis can hear his own speech in an inverted form, right? So I'd say that's a, that would be an interesting thing to say. And before that, the analyst is just an ego. It's not, it's not the plain mirror. The analyst is, is another ego. Hmm? Interesting stuff, Micah. I think it's, it's worth developing. So if you're, if you're, if you're planning on doing it, I, I, I'll, I'll give you some thumbs up. So I think we'll, we'll end here, Mike. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Mika. Yeah, good. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Leon, don't, don't you... Um, yeah, I just, just want to, want to hold up your book. Uh, the, the, I mean, it looks so it's, interesting. It's, uh, and then... it's, it's not a book. It's a zine. Um, zine. Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting product that a group that I work with here in Berlin, uh, we publish every year a zine called Lamela. And we've just published this zine. It's called Paternal Dysfunction. And it's, it's sort of an artistic creation where we have the members of the group uh, expressing uh, themselves in... in, in, in in relation to their engagement with the work of Lacan. So I just wanted to Wonderful. show it to you Wonderful. today. And yeah, you can, you can find more about it in, uh, if you go to lacanberlin.com. Lacan uh, or email. Thanks, Mike, for, uh, for reminding me to, to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. And thank you very much. And um, uh, always a pleasure. And um, a good learning experience and and um, like you were saying in the beginning we're going to hopefully put together um a whole lot of seminars next year yes but anyway thank you everybody mm -hmm.